We're super excited to be here. I'm excited to be here with my friends. Um, so we're just gonna kind of have a conversation. You guys cool with that? Okay. You wanna you wanna start by introducing yourself? Ugh. Um, <laughs> that was a no. <laughs> um, Everyone's like, no. Uh, what do I say about myself? Um, I'm Sarah J. Mass. <laughs> <Not Yeah. laughs> please, please, whatever. Uh, <laughs> uh, I'm the author of the Throne of Glass series, uh, as well as the Court of Thorns and Roses series. And, woo, thank you. Um, and I have nothing interesting to say about myself whatsoever. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, how about your book debuted at number one on the New York Times? <laughs> <laughs> like a little backstory. Uh, Alex and I have actually been friends since before I ever had a book deal um, and it's been really awesome as Wait. friends to witness like her own career take off Aww. as well and to go Aww. through this journey with her so it blows my mind that like we're here after all these years at this table talking to so many of you. That's why if we like seem a little overwhelmed that's why because we knew <laughs> each other as we say when we were little weenies. We weenies. In 2009. <laughs> Um, I'm Alex Brackett. I'm the author of the darkest. Oh, thank you. Woo! Oh, oh, no. um, I'm the author of the Darkest Mind series, as well as Passenger and Soon Wayfarer. And I also wrote a Star Wars book, which is really cool. Woohoo! On to Miss Suze. Already. Yeah. On to. Yeah, that was quick. We're rolling. All right. Hi, I'm Susan Dennard. I am the author of the Something Strange and Deadly series, as well as Truth Witch, which Woo! is the first in a four book epic fantasy series, and that is me. Yay! Hey! <laughs> and our special surprise guest, Victoria Avia! Woo! <laughs> yeah, so, so I'm so Victoria Avia. I wrote the Red Queen series, which is <laughs> ongoing. Um, yeah, and I met these three at Comic Con last year and kind of barnacled onto them. Barnacled. And now <laughs> I have barnacled onto a panel. <laughs> So hey, I, no, hey. no joke. I literally met her because she came to the Star Wars panel, not to like meet me or to meet no. anyone on the panel, but because she loves Star Wars. Yeah. And I was like, that's how I know we're gonna be friends. <laughs> um, I just feel so special. I just got a message, and we both immediately thought it was something bad, which tells you like it's like it says it's it's written in like like handwriting, and it just says there's a guy in the back. And instantly, as a writer, I was like, with a guy. With a gun. <laughs> I know. That's what I was like. No, no, it's all good. We're, we're good. The man in the back's totally cool. Yeah, he's, he's helping us. Thank yes. you, sir, wherever you are. Um, you, man in the back. Sorry for scaring all you guys. I know. <laughs> it's totally fine. <laughs> we took it to a dark place, as per usual. <laughs> um, so we're here to talk about friendship, and in particular, we'll, I think, kind of focus on female friendship and yes. how important that is and how important it's been to us. So I feel like maybe a good way to start is just to talk about female friendships that we witnessed in pop culture, not just in books, but also like TV, film. Why are you something. like looking at me so much? I mean, I'm going to look <laughs> this way. I'm no. Miss Alex. Like, it's hard. Do you want me to start? Like, yeah, that was your okay. start. Right, that was that you. was start this off. Um, I mean, I, I grew up with a couple of like female like role models that really like stuck out to me. And the biggest one was probably uh, Buffy the Vampire Slayer. Um, and I could be up here for like probably an hour just talking about Buffy herself, but what I really loved, um, and I, Buffy aired for the first time when I was like 13, 14 years old at like a really pivotal point in my life. Um, and what I loved the most was that Buffy had all of these relationships with, hello. Oh, okay. <laughs> Are you the guy in the, the, guy in the back? The guy in the here. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so Buffy. Okay, so Buffy. Um, <laughs> what I really loved the most about Buffy as a show was uh, her relationships with other women, her friendships with other women, um, and also like her relationship with her mom. And there were so few things when I was growing up that focused on female relationships. And you know, for those of you you know who have best friends, they're as important in your life as a romantic relationship and so Buffy that that show was there at like a such a pivotal point in my life and it was just something that kind of reflected a lot of the relationships I had with the the ladies around me uh, so that's like one of my my faves that's a good one it's a good one yeah um, for me I don't think I realized growing up I love Star Wars as you probably could tell <laughs> um, I 
And I just consumed so much like pop culture growing up and reading that I didn't realize there was such a thing called the Bechdel test. Do you guys know what mm -hmm. that is? Mm -hmm. Where there, I mean, the very basic rule is that there have to be more than one female character. They have to talk to each other and not about the main hero. Mm -hmm. And I did not realize how much stuff, including Star Wars, fails the Bechdel test. It's incredible. And so the first real, um, true, like, friendship-type squad that I fell in love with was the Sailor Moon Squad. Yes! Yeah? yeah? It's all lady power. That was my first introduction to, like, what I feel like is feminism, and yeah. it, was, well, it was so remarkable and touching to me and had a huge impact. And what was amazing about Sailor Moon and, and Buffy, like, they're, they're of a similar sort where Sailor Moon is, like, an unapologetic girly girl. Yeah. And she, like... And like all of the Sailor Scouts, like weapons and transformations, like they are like what society considers to be very, very girly with like ribbons exploding everywhere. <laughs> mm -hmm. And like, it was amazing for me to, I, I mean, I saw Sailor Moon at the same time I saw Buffy and yeah. like it was girls being girly and saving the world and like their, their relationships with other ladies, like saving the world over and over. I just got like chills. Yeah. I get very emotional I about Sailor I know, Moon. me too. <laughs> and they're all such different young women too, mm -hmm. which was so interesting to see that represented. They weren't just clones of each other. Mm -hmm. Who would your Sailor Scout be? I don't know, I feel like I might be Mars. I feel like oh, I've come around that. to that. I can see that. Yes. Um, and then my other favorite female friendship growing up was Rory and Lane on yes. Gilmore Girls. Oh my God, yes. yes. Yeah. Yes. Like the ultimate besties, they were amazing. Again, coming mm -hmm. from ver two very different backgrounds. I thought that was wonderful. You stole mine because I was totally <laughs> on Gilmore Girls. I also like I, I love watching that show now because I'm like I used to dress like Rory. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like wow, that was terrible fashion. <laughs> um, like chokers were really in. Do you guys chokers are back. That? Yeah. Are they? Are they back? Yeah. They're but back. they're probably not like from Claire's. Like the ones no, I they are the black ones. The, the, what? The, the, the I can pull out ones. my old necklaces. Yes. <laughs> I still have them in my childhood Go. closet. <laughs> Run home. Hey mom, that stuff I made you hang on to is cool again. <laughs> Um, yeah, Gilmore Girls, I unfortunately have to say that there's nothing that springs to mind from my childhood. I, I don't feel like there was a whole lot on TV that I watched. Um, there were lots of bromances that I loved. Uh, like, I loved, 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 loved Willow and Mad Mardigan and Willow. If you guys haven't seen that, I think they have an awesome bromance, but it was men. Um, that doesn't pass the Bechdel test at all. And I think... Most of the shows that I loved and watched were men or boys. Um, and I think like the first real female friendship that I got behind was in Avatar The Last Airbender, um, which actually, which I mean, that came out when I was in college. So it was like, I was older and it was, um, it wasn't one that actually happened right away. It took Katara and Toph a while to develop a friendship. They were really like, Top especially, it was quite thorny, and they didn't understand <laughs> each other. But I loved that they did finally bond, and um, like that meant a lot to me as a viewer. And now, we need we need more of that. Yeah, I'm kind of in the same boat in that I was thinking like, what were the things that I liked, and what were the female friendships in them that were great? And it took me a while to think of one. Yeah. And I think that's why most of the fan fiction I wrote was adding female <laughs> characters nice. to nice, male-driven nice. stories. Uh, but one that comes to mind that I really love because it's so complicated and sometimes annoying and sometimes really um, like heartwarming was Blair and Serena from Gossip Girl. Yeah. Yes. That's yeah. So I really loved how complex their relationship was because they were the bitterest of enemies and then the closest of friends at almost the drop of a hat. And sometimes it was just bad writing, but sometimes it was actually <laughs> like this is the female friendships and female relationships I think are the most complicated of all the relationships that there are. Uh, so it was really cool to be able to see the ins and outs of that. Cool, nice. Yeah, it's really, there's such a wide spectrum of female relationships that you can cover as a writer. And I think one of the wonderful things about YA especially, and especially in recent years, is that authors are starting to explore everything from the sisterly relationships like you see with Rue and Katniss in The Hunger Games, all the way up to like very complicated um, like interesting thorny relationships. Like for instance in Passenger, if you've read it, Etta and Sophia started off as allies and as I was revising I thought it would be so much more interesting if they were more of the frenemy, mm -hmm. where they were allies and agreed on certain things but there was something kind of complicated and thorny about the two of them and they just 
sort of clash, but sort of work together, and I like that. I'm really glad you, you did that, though, because, like, I find it does us like a disservice to just have like the mm. stock female friendship where everything's fine and there's like never any like problems and mm -hmm. it doesn't like change and adapt as the characters change because in our lives you know we we grow and, and we change and we get moved to different points in our life and I think it's really important to have different types of female friendships shown um, and you know the ones where you know they're allies to frenemies yeah. like I mean like the, it, I think right now in writing YA like we're kind of at the start of a like renaissance of getting to yeah. finally like show how like nuanced and interesting female relationships can be and how like important and life-changing they can be and like you know it's like as a, a it's, it's also like interesting to like circle back to the fangirl stuff but um, you know as a as a fangirl of many, many fandoms, I'm always like baffled by my own innate response when like a new girl comes on and she threatens my ship. I'm like, she has to die. Yeah. Like she needs to get away. But wait, then, wait, are you talking about the 100? Oh yes, uh, my obsession. <laughs> Um, How did I know? <laughs> that's everything. Everything in my life circles back to the hundred. Um, <laughs> But like, I'm al like, I always have this moment where I have to stop myself, like physically stop myself in this training that I've had where I see other women somehow like as these threats and not as allies and I have been reprogramming myself yes. for the past couple years, just me personally. It's all conditioning and I'm sure yeah. you guys have noticed this too. I've noticed it when I went back to read a lot of the YA that had come out like right at the beginning when it was starting its epic rise. So that a lot of authors to kind of build up the main character will use like this harsh contrast against mm -hmm. other Foil. females around her. So like if she doesn't wear makeup, it's like a statement mm -hmm. against the other girls who do wear makeup. Mm -hmm. And it's really interesting that you often, for a genre that is dominated by female leads, they're almost always surrounded by men. And that's like finally starting to change. Mm -hmm. What do you think? But I also think like it's important to highlight male female friendships yes. um, yeah. because I have a lot of really dear male friends mm -hmm. who it's never ever been anything but platonic um, and I'd like to see more of that honestly in fiction and on TV that just we're just friends you know there's no <laughs> shit there um, and that we're happy like that um, like I don't I don't know where iZombie is headed but I love the way Ravi yeah. and um, Liv our friends, I haven't like. Ralph watched. is for me. He's for me. I know, right? <laughs> uh, so, but I, I really like. I like that kind of a dynamic, and I or, or like Veronica Mars Veronica too. Mars. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So like, I, I really, I wish we saw more of that too. That's your jobs, guys. Yeah. Along with us, right? More of that. Because <laughs> um, yeah, I think I think I think the automatic assumption when like a handsome guy shows up on the page is, ooh, he's a possibility, which I totally get because I do that too. <laughs> yeah. Um, but then you know, I love. I love that about Avatar The Last Airbender, too, that you had this male-female friendships. So, yeah. Yeah. Do you have anything? Just ditto. Ditto. <laughs> yeah. Miss Aviard, do you, when you're working on a book, do you tend to consider the friendship relationships first or the romantic relationships? Which tend to be Out of relationships. Well, just for Red Queen, I, the basis of that is world and sort of the... Um, how the characters relate to that, so that's a relationship, I guess. It is, very much yeah. so. Um, but no, but after I kind of got the story down, a lot of it hinged on um, sort of romantic relationships, sort of sociopathic relationships. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, so those, and then I think as you're filling in the world and the characters, it's more do these people match in a romantic way or do these people match in a friendship way? Do these people match in an antagonistic way? And it's just figuring out what you know of these two people and where their pieces fit or where their pieces don't fit. Yeah, I totally agree with that approach. Um, and also, it's what the story demands. Mm -hmm. um, kind of sort of what feeling I'm going for in the story. It may not have a spot for a romance in that book, um, or story, or it may be only romance, which is also fun and excellent in its own way. So yeah, it just depends. Um, I remember in Throne of Glass, when, you were, when we were having one of our lunches in New York, <laughs> That we sat there for four hours and wouldn't let, wouldn't let them make us leave. Business lunch. Business lunch. <laughs> um, I remember it was right before you started writing Air of Fire, and you mentioned to me that, like, as you were writing, you discovered that to you, the heart of the story, it was the friendship. I don't, I'm trying so hard not to spoil people who have not read this series, which I'm assuming is like no one in this room. <laughs> but 
the friendship ended up being almost more important than the romantic relationship that mm-hmm. had been up to that point, and it was what happened to the friendship that... I'm trying so yeah. hard. Right. I'm sorry. <laughs> that, I appreciate yeah. it. Yeah. I really <laughs> that do. ultimately spurred this big change yeah. in it. So I wonder if you okay. can talk about character now, like, what growth. Do you, what? I don't know I what I mean. Know my own books. I'm like kind of circling um, around. All right. You know well, what I'm okay. about. I think like with, with Air of Fire, there, like friendship is like the theme of that book, and it's, it's really about, at, at its heart, the power of friendship to change you and heal the parts of you you didn't even know were broken. Um, and there are like so many different friendships um, that I do think like kind of eclipse the importance of the romance in that book. Um, but then also some of the friendships lay like a really solid groundwork for a romance that happens. Because I do think that like when you are in that kind of like true love, like that is like built upon like trust and respect and like you know equality in a relationship. And I, like a good friendship is kind of an awesome base. Yeah. Um, and so, but with, with that book, you know, it, it was about the power of friendship to, to heal you and to get you through these tough times. And with, uh, I'll call her Selena, um, <laughs> with, with Selena, so people get like really like, like uppity if I like call her, like, like if I switch between the names. I just train just... myself to say Aylin. I know, but I still slip in spoiler. you just like, yeah. <laughs> um, but is it? Like I tell people, like You'll live. tough luck. Yeah, whatever, survive. I mean, at, no, no. Oh my, sorry, but not. I'm uh, just gonna <laughs> crawl under the table. No, it's been four books, no, guys. No, you don't even. I <laughs> love the talk. I do this all the time. But so with with, um, with Selena's journey throughout the entire books, like from the very first novella until you know, even now, uh, the friendship, like her relationships with women, is something that constantly changes, and in the assassin in the desert, she has her first really serious female friendship that falls apart in a really awful way that leaves some pretty like brutal scars on her where she starts seeing other women as threats and not as allies. And it's not until um, Nehemia comes, comes along that she's able to start kind of like healing those wounds and the healing that she does with Nehemia um, allows her to later open up her heart to, to other women that, that show up, including Lysandra, who um, so she and Aylin, Al- sorry, <laughs> so hard. Um, like when they first meet each other, like they've spent their whole lives as frenemies, like, like, and they, they hate each other. And part of Aylin's growth as a character is that she learns to start looking at who is forcing her to look at other women uh, as, as enemies, uh, as threats. And like, does she have to make that choice to like lock them out and keep them at a distance? And at uh, that moment where she lets Lysandra into her life is a big defining moment for her character because it is a part of her that is healed and grown. And I wanted that to be as important as the romantic arc for her. Nice. Yeah. Um, Miss Averard in Red Queen and Beyond, <laughs> there's some pretty like interesting yes. female, female like dynamics together. Yeah, and I'm really interested in how they're read because a lot of people interpret them differently. And for me, yeah. one of the core female friendships, I consider it a friendship, is um, Mare and Farley. And that's, Farley is based on my best friend and it's a little bit of like, we're both very hostile people. So (laughs) a lot of our relationship could be read as like, oh my God, they're so mean to each other, but that's just how we communicate. Um, So yeah, so when I was writing that relationship plus uh, like a dystopian revolution, so that puts a little bit of strain on what is normally a friendship. uh, It was cool to have- (laughs) Just a small strain. Just a small strain. (laughs) Um, yeah, it was cool to have that friendship develop from just meeting each other to kind of feeling each other out to something built on respect and mutual sort of need and ambition, which doesn't sound like a really strong foundation, but what they go through, it becomes a stronger friendship because of it. And so by the end, they have these knockdown drag out fights, which are really, really fun to write. Um, it's really great to have your characters yelling all the things that's wrong with them at each other. Um, and it's very therapeutic. But yeah, but I think that's definitely something that is involved in friendships. Um, you do have your little blow up moments where you have to be like, you're being this and you're being this and you get it all out on the table and that's how you fix it and that's how you move on and that's how you grow. Mm-hmm. Um, so it, sometimes it can be a little hard because people will read that as like, well, they're not friends. And you're like, no, someone who wasn't a friend wouldn't care enough to tell them that. 
there's a relationship like that in the Darkest Mind series yeah. where they go from like they're still pretty contentious the way that they speak to each other. It mm -hmm. seems like they are not friends, but they right. care about each other very deeply. I, yes. I was about it. to say the Darkest Mind series is one of my favorite examples of friend like so many different types of friendships. That's I can't even good. talk about those I books know. without like crying. <laughs> I feel like so emotional. But like I think part of why I like became so obsessed with them and so deeply moved by them was because of the bonds that you built between your characters. Aww, thanks, dude. No, mm. and it was just like like who's your favorite like friendship like in that series? Do you have one? Well it's so interesting because that's like the one book I've written where I knew who the characters were from the beginning. Like I knew their personalities, I knew their dynamics mm. and I really I I still love, I mean, I love Liam and Chubbs' relationship with each other. That's a relationship where you're like, in any other situation, would you be friends? But as Liam says, like, my weirdness is like mutually compatible with your weirdness, which is at the core of a lot of friendships, yes. I think. Um, but I love uh, Ruby and Zoo's relationship. I think it's just like very sweet and pure <laughs> in a way that some of the other relationships in the series aren't. But. Um, yeah, I really wanted to write like a squad, like a it's the ultimate squad, the ultimate yeah. squad, and like just the have Black friends. Black Betty Gang. Black Betty Gang. I know, and it's that's one of the things I love about Truth Witch too mm -hmm. is that like the springboard for the series is are these two young women who are so like close. They're like close like sisters. Yeah. <laughs> Thread sisters. Thread sisters. Yeah. In fact, I'm gonna call out my cosplayer back there who's yeah. dressed as Toffee. Woo! Woo! Yeah. Take a bow. Take a bow. <laughs> that is that magnificent white cape that you see. Yes, it's awesome. I was staring at her earlier. I was like, she looks like my cover. And then she was like, I am your cover. <laughs> oh. um, but she has on a threadstone, which is symbolic in the book of um, the, the thread sister relationship. Because in this world, um, one of the characters of Sold can see the threads that bind people and how we're all related and how there are constantly new threads being formed between people or breaking. Um, and how we all connect into sort of the thread family that we choose versus the family that we're born into. Um, and some of us are really close to our family. I love my family. I'm, I'm very tight with them. Not always, but I am now. And uh, so I'm very blessed with the family I have. But I also have an amazing support network of friends. And um, not just friends either, but like acquaintances who mean a lot to me that I wouldn't say I necessarily know everything about them, but I rely on them. I see them every day. And those sorts of bonds are, again, nuanced. So I think you said you want to see more nuance in, in YA and in stories. And I, I think that's really the heart of what I was trying to share in Truth Witch, is how you have these different bonds that form and evolve. There are strains, <laughs> as she said. There's a lot of strain on the various relationships that are growing and changing in the book. Um, and how it will all turn out, you'll have to read to find out. <laughs> I know, that brings up a good point. Like, what do you guys think makes for an authentic portrayal of friendship in books? Is it's it that, like, nuance? question. Or is it, I don't know, how do you, how do you explore friendships? I'm going, like, super, I'm going deep. Yeah. Ooh. They're harder than romantic relationships, for sure, because you can't add in, like, well, they're hot. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I guess it would be... I'm like, there are so many types of listen. friendships and so many types yeah. of relationships, you know, and so um, I, th I think we, we sort of, we build our cast and we assign them maybe roles or, you know, dip, dip, we all have different methods for how we do that. Um, and I, I kind of think the, the way the friendship, it unfolds as you write it. It's not just, we don't always know where it's going. You know, we may think, oh, I'm going to put this as her best friend. And then as we write it, we're like, wow, there's a lot of conflict there that mm -hmm. I didn't know. And so you, as a writer, choose to explore that or not. And if you choose to explore that, I think that that brings a level of, of realism to it, um, showing that the ups and downs and, and journeys that we all take with other people of all different levels and degrees of friendship. Um, and I don't, I don't know how there is to do that. I know personally I have to revise a lot to I make it you. feel real, make that dialogue feel right. So, But I think it's like, I think you have to actually show it like it sounds yeah. like, like like show don't tell but like 
you need to give significant emotional beats and moments to that friendship true, where true. like instead of like the romantic lead they turn to the friend for advice or like during the epic action scene like the like them and the friend go you know like fight back to back totally. um, yeah. so it's like giving it the page time and then like a lot like thinking about the emotional threads where like you basically think about the two people and like what they're both both bringing to the table in that scene and what's like driving them um and you give it the, the page time it it deserves and you you know think about like when something goes down in your life and like you the first thing you want to do is like call up your best friend and just be like like vent about everything or like you know just like cash it out with them um so like having those instincts like like that you have in a real life friendship like putting that onto the page um, and like reminding yourself, like it doesn't have to like go to like the romantic lead. Like if there's like romance, like you can have them have emotional growth uh, with the friendships. But um, you definitely like. But I think like you were saying, like revising. Yeah. Like you know, like my first drafts, it's always like kind of bare bones, and I have to really go through during the editing process and look at those emotional threads and and what uh, each character is is feeling and what they're thinking of in that moment, and you know, bringing that out to some degree. Um, I have to ask you, do you find it harder to create a friendship arc or a romantic arc? Um, why are you asking me this? I, I, I um, wonder why. I, you know, <laughs> I think that, like, I'm such a huge, huge romance reader. Like, I'm the biggest fan of romance, so I always love writing the romantic stuff. Mm -hmm. um, but I do, I do try and treat the romance as, you know, a different like not just for like the sexy times but as like a real relationship that I have to build as well um, but with those uh, I think I'm like very like careful when I do build those female friendships because I want it to feel like real in a way mm -hmm. like I definitely I put in like a lot of thought to both um, but I think with like the the friendship stuff like that like that's like a different part of my like whatever yeah. writing stuff goes on and it's it comes from like a different part of my heart which sounds so cheesy um, <laughs> I'm like the cheesiest person alive um, what about you do you i i find romance harder than friendships i don't know why do you write like the most amazing romance i mean <laughs> thank you but uh, no but yeah yeah thank you <laughs> i guess so yeah. you agree i don't want to take a compliment apparently <laughs> um i don't know I, it's so interesting to me i I don't know what it is about romance where I just naturally gravitate more towards friendship and depicting friendship versus romance. I don't know. What do you think? Because you, I mean, but it's so funny because when I entered Red Queen, I had like an assumption that it was going to be like super romantic, but really it's like friendships. Yeah. I find relationships in general difficult to write. I find like um, my problem is always character work. That's my hardest thing to do. Uh, I am all about plot and world building, and That's so if you're you, a screen no, no, no. <laughs> so good. even in school they used to be like Victoria, this needs more character. I don't care about these explosions, and I'm like, but I do. <laughs> <laughs> one more explosion, more, one more tank, please. Um, yeah, so relationships in general are just um, the hardest thing. But I like when things make me work hard. That's, I like characters that are more complex and difficult to write because it makes you a better writer. So when you finally conquer that mountain and you're like, oh my God, this makes sense. This is, this is happening in a realistic way. You get a little pat on the back and then you're like, all right, I have the rest of the book to write. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> Again. Yeah, I guess too, I, I don't know. I like writing romance too. I find it fun. There's a natural built-in tension there, which makes it in some ways for me easier to write. But um, I also think like you don't have to have a friendship arc. Like the friend can be the friend. Mm -hmm throughout they can but the that, friend cannot disappear the friend cannot disappear no they <laughs> can't suddenly like just be off the page the they, they have to remain and and hopefully get as they're not just a sidekick character there to fulfill the main character's role or purpose or anything like that but they it could just be they have ups and downs but there's no like full growth arc like you might find in a romance um you know sam and frodo have their problems but at the end of the day they're still <laughs> Besties. <laughs> that problem seems gone. Sam and have their problems. I you know. That. I'm just saying. It made me think of them on like a therapist couch. Well, I was thinking of it like that too. So like, all right, guys. We have some Lord of the Rings mega fans on this panel. <laughs> and it's oh like, God. I almost feel like we can't even, we can't talk about that fellowship yeah. relationship and bond. But it's like, I know no Victoria ladies. and I, and we've, ta we've all talked about how like, Without Arwen, it would have just been like a sea of dudes oh, in that book. Dudes. Yeah, but like even like Arwen was like 
such a baller in like fellowship. Like <laughs> fellowship came out when I was like 15 and I remember being in that theater opening night and seeing the, the flight to the Ford where Arwen rides down the, the Nazgul and like I was just like, Literally, like crying in the theater because I was like, this is everything I want to do with my life. This is my goal to be an elf princess and ride a horse and yell at it in elvish. Um, I was the founder and president of the Lord of the Rings totally. Club, by the way, um, in high school. I like... It was me and my like two friends at every club meeting. No one ever came. And you would um, just watch and rewatch the trailers, the trailers. over and yeah, over Yeah, there was again. no YouTube, like no Twitter back then, no Tumblr. So we would go on the New Line Cinema website yep. and just like look at the trailers over and over and to over let again. It load that was for our like hours. intellectual <laughs> club. Yeah. Um, yeah. But with lo like with the rest of like Lord of the Rings, like I mean, it's like. Well, there's Sausage a deleted fans? thing they did it because Arwen originally showed up at Helm's Deep and the, they shot it. Mm -hmm. And it's never been released. Yep. And I'm pissed. And you can find pieces of her that they recolored her hair blonde and they no. gave her like an elven cloak. Yeah. Oh my God. I have frame by frame work for these things. <laughs> um, well, then you had, so you had Arwen and then Ao, Ao, and yeah. Hera, who yeah. then like gets my other favorite moment mm -hmm. where she like kills the, the Witch King. Spoiler alert. Uh, that's like the best line too. That's such a mic drop. I know. Whatever yeah. the equivalent is in the Lord of the Rings, Middle Earth. Like, <laughs> what if like Arwen Staff and Aowen had a conversation like at one point? Like that would have been like. Well, because it's like, weird. With their, their names like, and not know, talking about a guy. <laughs> well, they're still pitted against each other yeah. and they never meet. That's yeah. like what drove me crazy about that because mm -hmm. they both are after the same man and yeah. he is a fine man. And but, even Galadriel, yeah. like queen of everything. Oh, yeah. yeah, she could like, kick all their butts. Like the women are just these like islands yeah. In, yeah. in the movie and like. Like, I was, like, okay with it because Legolas was my boyfriend, yeah. and I had, like, other priorities. <laughs> well, sitting I, don't even, I don't even think I noticed what's so sad. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't even notice until recently how very infrequently women would show up in leading roles. I thought it was totally fine that in Willow, Sorsha falls in love with Mad Mardigan after a love potion. That's <laughs> not creepy. <laughs> now I look at that and I'm like, that's not actually okay. That's how Voldemort was conceived. It's yeah. not cool. <laughs> it's not cool. Thanks for bringing that into perspective. Oh my god. Wait, and then in The Hobbit, are there any female characters? Galadriel um, does some does some stuff. Like if it's about we're it. talking about the, the movie. The movie, they're oh. Galadriel, but like and in the book. Tario. Oh, the book yeah. didn't like, have pretty much Are there any. no women in Isn't The Hobbit? Isn't there a mention like, of like Elrond's smoking hot wife, and then that's like it? Well, no, because she's, she's dead at that dead? point. Like, Calabrian is okay. dead. Oh, that's even worse. She's so dead like the Lord of the Rings panel. Lord of the Rings. Like, it'll go on for hours. I know. Maybe. Um, well, no, she's not dead. She's in the Undying Lands. Whatever. Wait, what? Someone had the answer, I think. Does anyone know if there are women in the Hobbit book? In the actual book. That's pretty uh, creepy, yeah, isn't it? Like the, yeah. But the these are town. things I didn't notice when I was in, like, yeah. nine years old and reading it. I didn't notice. Which is but, sad. Which is sad. Didn't know no, but sad. that's where we're, like, programmed, I yeah. think, in some ways, to not notice those things. And now, like, amazing ladies are calling that crap out. And, like, when I saw Mad Max Fury Road... Yeah, um, that's that, a great one! That was a revelation for me. Like, like that was a, a beautifully, like, perfectly, wonderfully shot action film. But it had these, like, so many different female characters who then had, like, a war council together. Yeah. Like, they, they got to do, again, like, all the stuff I dream of doing. Like, <laughs> riding through the Namibian desert. Like, when the apocalypse comes, that's where you'll find that's Sarah. That's where you'll find me. <laughs> on a motorcycle in the desert. <laughs> Just rolling <laughs> for the pack. Um, oh God! Well, even the Force Awakens. How e like everyone or not everyone, sane people, annoying people were like, "Oh, Ray is such a Mary Sue." Oh my God, what is like? And then Tumblr was Mary like, Sue. "Let me tell you a thing." Mary Sue. Sue. James Bond's a Mary Sue. Yeah. A Gary Sue. Yes, Gary, Gary Sue. Sue. <laughs> but the trailer for Rogue One passes the Bechdel test, by the way. It does. The trailer for Rogue One. So oh. I, I Excited. lost my mind at that last shot in the Rogue One trailer where it's like, what will you become? And I just was like, what? Like, I, I wanted to rip my face off because I was so excited. I was in an air, this is a side note, I'm sorry. I was in an airport when the Rogue One trailer came out and like I was walking to the bathroom and I just heard, you know in the, if you guys have seen it, like that <laughs> alarm, I could hear it like on every single phone oh I passed. <laughs> So everyone loves Star Wars, yay! But it's so sad. It was really Leia, and it was Mon Mothma, but like no one knew her name yeah. really, even. And no. they don't actually have a conversation that you see. But what you were mentioning about Rey being like a Mary Sue, like yeah. when Ugh, I, I when I grew term. up watching Star Wars, I wanted to be 
Han Solo, like I, but I also wanted to be Luke. I wanted to be a Jedi. I wanted to be like, I literally wanted to be what Rey is. She gets to fly. <laughs> she gets to be a, a pilot. She gets to like wield, sorry, spoilers. She gets to wield the lightsaber. And that yeah. moment in the theater when Rey like takes up that lightsaber, I, I, I cry all the time, by the way. Yeah. But I like literally burst into tears, and I, I've seen the new movie six times now, not even joking. And but my favorite time watching it was the second time I was in this crowded theater in New York City, and in that moment when Ray gets the lightsaber and turns it on, the entire giant audience cheered like so loudly. I thought like the like ceiling would come down, and it was yeah. one of those moments where. It was like a theater full of people cheering for a woman, like getting yeah. to do badass stuff. And like, that's something that growing up, we saw so little of, and it means so much to me to see that. Now. I think there's such a hunger for that. And there have been, there, it, there's been women in these characters, and there's been this literature, and it's been around, but we haven't been able to find it. And now it's finally been put out in the forefront. And just to add to theaters freaking out, I saw Batman versus Superman. Hold your thoughts. Um, <laughs> and I've never heard a theater cheer as loud as it did when Wonder Woman pops up. Yeah. And her theme song kicks in, and it's a, like a guitar, and it's like, all right. <laughs> I'm very ready for that movie. She's like, I'm here to save this mess. Yes, and plus it's World War I with Chris Pine and Wonder Woman. Come oh, it's going to be so good. I'm so I'm excited. like punching you. I'm so sorry. No, I'm okay with that. I'm okay with that. She's so excited. She's like hitting Sue's. Okay. I'm just happy to be here. Well, I think it like with the Ray thing and the Luke thing, it sort of speaks to the different standards female characters are held to, and that's a completely different panel. But like, it yeah. bugged me so much that people got on Ray's case when it, it, I feel like it's been set up that there's something in her past that she's like tapping into Don't something say more than the Force. Don't say <laughs> Luke, Luke, in A New Hope, is literally told he's holding one of the most dangerous weapons in the galaxy, and what does he do? He points it at his face. Like, <laughs> but it's okay, he somehow destroys the like most terrifying weapon in all of the galaxy. <laughs> You've seen that picture, right? Yeah. <laughs> We're, he really is such a dope. I love Luke, though. Luke's it's kind of great. Have you seen way. the Sebastian Stan yes. face swap? Yes. He oh, looks oh identical gosh. to Did you guys Luke see Skywalker. That? It's Bucky with the good hair? Bucky with the good hair, yeah. Ah, <laughs> uh, yeah. Well, I, well, even like Captain America, like even Civil War, I was kind of like, I'm glad that they're kicking us separately. Yeah. Kicking butt separately, but like, <laughs> <Too late>. sorry guys. <laughs> Too late to take that back. Um, but like, I want to see more like interactions. Yeah, all the women in those movies are redheads too. What's up with yes. that? <laughs> there's, there's a trope that like, the, in YA the special redhead. Yeah. I'm, I'm guilty of that. I had a redhead. I have a redhead. Yeah. Yeah. It's a pretty hair color. It's wonderful. We collect it's, you guys. It's As you know, if you, if you ever come up to me during a signing, I'm like, I love your hair. I say the same thing. Like, is that your natural hair color to like, <laughs> it's so embarrassing, but it is quite pretty. We took it to a random place just then. Yeah, we did. Sorry. We did. <laughs> I feel like we must be getting Ginger Con, close to when we should be taking questions, but the guy at the back left of the room, are you there? Ma'am, sir. Guy Do you want me to keep an eye on time? Yeah, what time is it? One time. We have 20 minutes oh, left, have... I think. Do you guys have questions? Do you want us to keep chatting? Oh, we got Squirrel Girl over here. Yes. It says Squirrel Girl on her Bring head. Bring it, Squirrel Girl. She was just being mean. <laughs> Yeah, come up to the microphone. I think they're on, right? Yeah. Uh, hello, yes, they are. Hi. Hi. So thank you all for coming. I really just want to express our appreciation for that. Um, my question, and I know you, you've uh, touched about on this a lot, the idea that different friendships, you know, male, female, all of them have different dynamics depending on who people are. But even considering all the different dynamics for every friendship and all the different kinds of friendships, do you think there's one aspect or one trait that's important when writing any friendship? Conflict. Yeah, actually. Yeah. yeah. That's the most interesting type of relationship is a relationship that has some form of conflict in it, I think. I one think person wants something and the other person wants something. Yeah, or they happen. want the same thing, but they have different ideas of how to get it. Yeah. So yeah, I think, I mean, that's just if it's a story, storytelling mm -hmm. conflict how you propel any story forward. So there should be conflict in every aspect of the story. Um, so yeah, good answer. Yeah, don't be afraid to like have your friends disagree with each other and spread you. And I think like challenging, not, I mean naturally friends challenge each other to be better people, to think about things different ways. Like it's okay to have them be on the outs for a while and have to be kind of an end of the world. Ditto. Ditto. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that was a 
Um, I really thank you for writing a book with a lot of kind of like musical things in it because those are so hard to find and because I'm a really musical person that just means oh, a lot to me. Thank you. That's awesome. And then um, for Ms. Apeard, um, what I saw this on your Tumblr. What does Neil or Bleed do? Oh, Neil or Bleed is the tagline for Blast Sword. Okay. So it's on the cover. Okay. And uh, by the end of the book, we'll find out who kneels and who bleeds. <laughs>
So that's what authors do, I guess. <laughs> anyway, please. I guess I am um, the lame one of the group because I like I, I do the definitely use the like behind the names and baby names dot com and all that. But I also I know the truth which anyway because it's high fantasy with lots of different worlds. I wanted each world each place to be a culturally distinct one. So I developed the culture and then evolved the names from there. Um, and I also used the old tip from George R. R. Martin, which is to use names that we are familiar with and just make them a little fantasy. <laughs> so, Sophia is based on Sophia, which is Germanic. <laughs> so, yes, I like to think about it way too hard. But I will say I struggle very much with my, one of my leading ladies, uh, Assault, because my editor, I love her, but she didn't like the original name, fair enough. But it's very hard when you've written a book to change the character's name, to just completely change it. Um, and I know, like, Sarah, I know you were asked to change Kale, and you're like, yeah, <laughs> which was a good choice in the end. It was, it was the right that. choice. Yeah, you, yeah, you made the right choice not to do it. His last name, okay, it was Kale, and then his last name was W Y D R A E L, like, Y Drail, basically. <laughs> Like 
dream to love relationship, Good. and it's the story of my dream. So it's, <laughs> it's in here, or is it so totally, like, I've been writing it to my head, like, while I'm, like, doing my makeup, I'm, like, thinking about, like, my romance, I'm, like, I'm a married woman. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. 